What I'm telling you has been proven, uh, repeated. A lot of wealthy people have started that way. And just solid, you know, solid way of, of, of getting the business and not guessing. Um, I have sold to many celebrities. Um, I've sold certainly to, you know, DJ Khaled and then the, a, lot of, a lot of his friends, uh, to um, Offset, to Justin Bieber, to Beyonce, uh, to Future. Is there a car you regret it not buying? <laughs> well, Hi everyone, I'm David Lee and welcome back to my stable. You know, uh, this is my first Q&A uh, section and thank you everybody for sending me the questions on Instagram. So let's go ahead and get right to it. The first question, why did you pick Ferrari to collect in the particular and what other brands would you collect if it wasn't Ferrari? So I guess I've, um, it, it, was, it was starting to be when I was uh, first uh, wanting and loving a car. Um, I always wanted an exotic car. Uh, I had the Lamborghini Countach poster on my wall and um, that was my dream car. And actually I did, um, by the age of 29, buy a pre-owned uh, Lamborghini, but it was a Diablo at that time. It wasn't a Countach anymore. So I had bought that. Um, but I've always liked Ferraris. Like I said, in high school, I, I rode in Track Magazine. I saw the 288 GTO, the first supercar that Ferrari made. And I loved that too, but I never thought I could um, you know, attain it. I mean, even at that time, it, because it was limited edition, it rose up to a million dollars. I mean, you're talking about 1985, a million dollars. So that was not even in my, in my mind that it was attainable. I liked it, I loved it. Uh, it was my you know, favorite car which that's why now that I have one, it's very sentimental to me. But, but you know, I figured, you know, a Lamborghini Countach was still somewhat affordable. I just had to work hard and I would uh, do that. So like I said, by the age of 29, I was able to um, kind of have my dream come true. I bought a pre-owned uh, 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 Lamborghini Diablo VT. At those days, the, the uh, Diablo VT weren't very good mechanically. I always had problems and it was always in the shop and it was in the shop I would say half the time it was in the shop when it was in my garage right so half the time so I didn't like that and so one day I decided to go in you know just you know change it up you know to trade it in for something else and and so at that time of course I loved the Italian styling the passion that of Italian um, you know designers and, and car makers so Ferrari would be I guess in that same line obviously at that time not as aggressive as the Lamborghini and, and showy it was more refined but the, and we also know the the engine and the and the way it was made was probably more uh, uh, less finicky and less uh, problematic so I decided to trade it in for a uh, 355 spider okay Ferrari uh, f355 spider and since then I just kind of you know, was I, I would trade it to get the next one a three three sixty and trade it to get the next one a four thirty and so forth. So that's kind of how I um, stayed with Ferrari and didn't give me much problems. It was reliable. It still was very cool, and and that's why I did that. Uh, but also the fact that my as I was getting into the investment of it, the first investment classic car nineteen sixty five two seventy five GTS. As I was doing the research. Ferrari also showed that they had a lot of cars that were valuable, that were increasing in value. They had the most expensive, you know, car in the world, right? As we know, the 250 GTO. The brand is very strong globally. So I was thinking if I was going to collect and go into any brand, Ferrari would probably be the best brand to do it. I did like other cars too. I mean, of course, I like McLaren, I like Lamborghini, I like Porsches, but I figured at that time early on, I said, I'd rather be important to one brand than not important to any brands. And I see a lot of collectors, they, they buy what they like, which is fine, but it's all over the place, a lot of different brands. How can you really be very important to one brand if you're like that, right? Uh, in my case, as I'm uh, specialized in collecting Ferraris, I think you will agree with me that I'm really pegged with Ferrari and, and, and it really, I guess I stand out as far as a Ferrari collector, uh, a car collector. So let's move on to the second question. Number two, 
How did you get the Michael Schumacher F1 car? And did you ever meet Michael Schumacher? So the car in, in, that I have is the 2002 um, F1 car. And how that came about was, just as I mentioned, because I was recognized in, as a guy that just collects Ferraris and collects you know, all kinds of, from the classic all the way to the present. I was involved in, with, with my dealership. I bought new cars. I went to the event. I was really um, you know, noted by the factory as a, you know, uh, this, a VIP customer, an uh, individual that is really appreciate Ferrari and had a big passion for Ferrari. So my dealer told me the factory had contacted them to want to offer me this car. Um, actually, before that, they had offered me uh, other F1 cars, um, Alonzo's uh, car, which I thought it was okay. And then they, so I had passed on that. Then they had finally, then they offered me, how about the Michael Schumacher 2002 championship winning car? And of course I said, wow, that's fantastic. So, so I, it, was, it was offered by the uh, factory. I didn't buy it from the market or from the auctions or anything. So it was really special that, um, that, that to be able to get it that way. And you know, for Ferrari, the F1 car is their ultimate in performance, right? All the road cars are great and everything. But even you know, as you remember Enzo, he created, um, he decided to produce road cars in order to fund the racing, right? Scuderia Ferrari, that's, you know, the racing, Ferrari racing. And, um, you know, so, so, and also, as you can imagine, performance at the peak uh, of car performance, automobile, is the F1 car. And so that's where they would hang their hat to be, where's their performance level and so forth. So the F1, the racing, is such an important thing for and for them to offer to me to be the custodian and the steward of these important cars, it really shows, I felt it showed that Ferrari really valued my uh, collection and my passion for, for their brand. So let's move on to the third question. Is there a car you regretted not buying? <laughs> well, um, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of cars, I mean, looking back, of course, from a value perspective, cars that I could have bought 10 years ago or 15 years ago it would have been, it was a lot of money back then, but if I bought it, it would have been crazy money, right? 250 short wheelbase, uh, 250 GTO, uh, McLaren uh, F1. Um, you know, all those cars would be um, amazingly expensive. The, you know, the California Spider, 250 California Spider. So, yeah, there, there is a few, but you know, you can, you can never um, look at it that way. I mean, today you could buy, and, and I'm sure in 10, 15 years it's going to go up some more, so, which is why I have bought cars uh, from 1964, Ferrari's 1964, all the way to the present, the iconic ones, the ones we know that's going to go up, the ones we know is limited, the ones we know it's appreciated and it has a track record. It's a blue chip of Ferrari cars. So I think, I think we'll be doing well in the future. Okay, let's go to the fourth question. What advice do you have for a 20 year old who wants to start investing in real estate? Well, I think the important thing is, um, you know, a lot of people ask me because I also guest speak a lot of times at the USC uh, entrepreneur uh, classes in the intro to entrepreneur, family business, uh, graduate school, uh, feasibility and so forth in, in various universities. I think the best way, it's, it's really hard to just pick something from the air and, or, or, or throw a dot at it and, and see where it sticks. You want to know what is solid as far as what to do. Where is there demand? How can you accomplish it? So it's really a question of that. I suggest to a lot of young people, if you want to, um, first of all, know what your passion is. Know what area of interest that you want to work with. Because when you work with something that you're interested, time just disappears, right? You don't mind spending the time on it. If you are passionate about it, you're going to do a good job. You're going to really um, spend a lot of focus on it and do a good job and show performance. I would say first understand that. Then work for a company that you would respect and that what you want to learn from that uh, will, you know, that's in your area of interest, right? You work in there. You, you, you get in there, you start, you could even start really low, you know, and be patient and, and be a little bit more giving than wanting to take. Just build yourself up. What happens then is just you build yourself up, you build your network of people in that company, 
okay? You start to learn about what the company does and you see where the company, maybe it's not in their right space or it's too small for them, too big for them, they leave that business on the table. And, that ta and, when you, and at a certain time, as you're seeing that, you're also showing your performance. You're showing the, the company's clients that you're, you're the one that is making it happen. You're showing that the company sees that you're making it happen and your performance is good and they, they promote you and to a higher position. You know, spend a little time working for a company to learn the, 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 the ropes. Don't, don't just take imagination and think, why, why would you want to make those mistakes yourself? Let be paid for that. Know those uh, 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 from companies that have done it long ago. Don't make those mistakes. Learn from that. Make mistakes that you couldn't avoid, but learn it on the job. I know so many people then that started as working from, uh, in a company that they were interested in and then branched out because uh, against the company, didn't, it was, there was some business left on the table, but it, it, was too, it wasn't right for the company, but it was right for you. you. You were able to meet a lot of people with the staff that you can bring along with you to your own company. The customers knew that you did a good job. You were the one that did it, so they would trust you to give you the job. And, uh, and it would be just, um, and then you got a solid business, a spinoff from it. You know, that's what I would recommend is the, really just the best way. To kind of think about it, to say what what it, be, and it, what it could be, and throw a dot on it, and, and uh, you know, and say that that would be it is is really not the smartest way to do it. What I'm telling you is been proven, uh, repeated. A lot of wealthy people have started that way, and just solid, you know, solid way of of, of getting the business and not guessing. So that would be my advice on that. Number five. Which rappers have visited Hingwa Lee and brought watches, for, bought watches from me? Well, you know, uh, it's all, you know, my, my customer primary are regular customer folks like you, just like you and me. And, and that's fine. But sometimes you get, you know, these uh, special kind of high profile celebrity clients. And, and, and those are uh, good and bad, right? Uh, it, it takes a lot more, um, you know, uh, a lot more hand holding a lot more arrangement and to accommodate to those clients, right? Uh, and they're really buying the same thing that anybody else would do that, that doesn't need that service. But it's okay, it's fun sometimes and it's, it's all good. Um, I have sold to many celebrities. Um, I've sold certainly to you know, DJ Khaled and then the, a, lot of, a lot of his friends, uh, to um, Offset, to Justin Bieber, to Beyonce, uh, to Future. Um, to um, you know a lot throughout throughout the years, but those are the recent ones, and I know that that is those those folks are um, entertainers that a lot of young people like to listen to. It just kind of you would be you would recognize those names, but there was a lot of different high profile people, whether they're celebrities or just socialites or whatever that that's come through my business, and it's really interesting for me to um, to meet them. And, um, and, and interesting enough, at the end of the day, they're just people, just like you and me. You know, they just, they, they have a job that, that's what uh, leads them to do. So anyways, it's fun. And um, yeah, so th that would be those um, names there. Let's go with number six. What is your advice for someone who wants to begin collecting watches? Well, I would say, um, you know, start to get involved, get to know into it, maybe research there's a lot of research right now there's a lot of um, clubs that you can join other watch people you can talk to and and start to kind of really understand the direction of where it's going you know uh, you know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of watches that you can buy and enjoy and and the great mechan mechanicalism um, they're not brand known brands but they're more affordable the known brands have a lot of the the marketing and the and all those things kind of built into it that, that, that the price has to be there for that to happen. But then those are sometimes too expensive. Could you not enjoy a watch that is made just as well, just as complicated, with just as much passion? You know, everybody wants limited edition. Well, these companies are probably very limited in how much they produce. And to be able to buy that, and you never know, one day those, those companies would pop. They would, find, they, would, they would get recognition. They would find their way to 
uh, as the company builds to something that is incredible. So I think that it could be done that way. Um, certainly if you have more budget, then you can really, you can buy into the brand name ones as well. Uh, but I would also say to um, perhaps make a relationship with the uh, jeweler. It seems like in the way, the direction, how watches are going, you really need to build a relationship. And, and so that, and, and be loyal to that company and let the company help you. Because going all around, not being loyal is, is hit and miss. And a lot of the good product is not available right there. You have to wait for it to come. So I, I would suggest building a relationship, talking to the salespeople, understanding that. Okay, let's go with number seven now. If you were to be on the next Fast and Furious movie, which, uh, which car uh, or cars would you, would you drive uh, in it? You know, um, <clears throat> obviously Fast and Furious is a, it's a great franchise. I had an opportunity to meet uh, Sun Kang and, and uh, you know, just to have a friendship with him, which is great. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it seems like you know, those, they, they got a lot of fast cars and everything going. I guess um, if I was to have a car in there to be able to, to, to also be fast and to be, um, to be able to do the job, I guess, and so forth, I would need one that is probably, <laughs> yeah, probably the LaFerrari or the SF90. All right, let's go to the final question, number eight. When business and work gets tough, how do you persevere in the tough times and the tough moments? Well, in a business life, you're going you're gonna to have cycles, down economy, you're going to have cycles where um, something is not going well with your, your business, there's competitors that come in and gives you a big fight, you have employee problems, there's all kinds of expected situations that's going to happen. In my 30 years, I, there was countless big and small issues and and you learn from it you just try to you know really um, work through it having mentor and having good advisors would be so important that have experience that have gone through uh, similar problems to be able to you know bounce off ideas from is important but um, not acting not acting with not reacting is important. Being calm, because when you're when you react in a in a non-calm manner, or when you're angry, you always make the wrong decision. When you're hasty and you're brash, always calm down. You don't need to make decisions that fast. Calm down to think about what is the wise thing to do. And again, advisors to talk talk it through. That's always so important. That's why people have board of uh, board of uh, advisors, board of directors. It's a place where Otherwise, people can, you know, hear your problems and advise you. So, and, and, and you have to persevere. You can't, you have to be thick skinned. You have to keep getting up. You cannot say, oh, this is too much for me. I, 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 I'm, it's going to ruin me. I quit. You cannot. Even if the situation is bad and you have a setback, you got to be able to see through that. You got to step up. You got to rise up to the occasion. Keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and wait that time to pass. And I believe in the future, if you keep doing the right things, things will start to come back. Better, the same, a little bit better, no matter what, it will come back. So that's my advice on that. Thank you everybody for your questions. I appreciate you listening and we'll see you next time.